Uh, uh, welcome everybody to season three of Learning with CAHS. Uh, CAHS is a, a undertaking by Nanaimo Ladysmith Public Schools uh, and UBC Press. And this year we're happy to partner with Vancouver Island Regional Libraries. My name is Ted Cadwallader. My two co-hosts, Tsum uh, Kwasin and uh, uh, Stephanie Johnson and Lawrence Mitchell. Uh, and we'll introduce our esteemed guest momentarily. I'm going to kick it over to our friend Tsum Kwasin to welcome us all to this beautiful space. Henderson, Vancouver Island Regional Libraries, E UBC Press. Um that's at T we at the Shkop that it's an aquail e Stelum Aitapka. Khachat's art main Haitka. Haitka at a high all eight squail at an aquail. I <laughs> Ihwam slashakan stochtanat kwalmach. Ihwam slachan tasta ikith etana quail. Haichka kutstwa i etana tamach etana quail. Eat utmak squail. Nawash kwam kwam sata salitst zita siam haichka.
Ich habe gerade noch gefreut. It's uh, so yeah, yeah, thank you, my friend. Um, it is our pleasure today to welcome our friend uh, Sachesh Anderson. Um, I know in if you've looked on the website, you saw a small introduction that tells who he is. Uh, it doesn't do him justice to the work that he's done over the course of his lifetime and the contributions that he's made, uh, not only here in what's now Canada, but also internationally. He's been involved in the constitutional process for Canada along the way. He's a constitutional advisor for the Mi'kmaq Nation. Uh, National Indian Brotherhood, Assembly of First Nations, uh, a human rights lawyer, lawyer internationally. Uh, he's one of the strategists, expert advisors, and drafters of the United Nations principles and guidelines for the protection of Indigenous heritage, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and probably foremost, he's the partner of one of our great friends, Dr. Marie Batiste. Um, and his co-author on the book that we're going to talk about today, Protecting Indigenous Knowledge and Heritage uh, and a Global Challenge. So, welcome, Sakrish. We're so pleased that you're here. Yeah, thank you. Now, we have uh, some statements that are written in the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that's uh, and they're certain pieces that I just have written down on my notes here, and I've used them before, that says things like, states shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention and redress for, and states shall take effective measures to ensure that. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, but your book is a, is a bit of a, a review of some of the things that you've worked across on over the course of your life to ensure that Indigenous knowledges, language, histories, um, perspectives are protected against the onslaught of language, religion, uh, government legislation, and, and just uh, what, what you phrase as cognitive imperialism in, in uh, parts of the book. Would that be accurate? Yeah, the cognitive imperialism is my wife Marie's uh, great contribution that started to make sense of our education and why we had such a resistance to our, our formal Eurocentric kind of education is that why we had these voices and spirits uh, in our minds, uh, in our consciousness that were always uh, struggling and fighting and uh, criticizing uh, what we were learning in school, even though we were trying real hard just to pass, you know, to, we got to get a C out of this course to pass and, and move on through the system. And so we had to memorize it and really uh, put it in a place um, so we could repeat it on some kind of test. But all the while, we had these spirits always whispering to us that, don't listen to that. You know, that's not the whole truth. That's just partial, um, you know. And we had that through our whole education system. And so when she was getting her doctorate at Stanford, um, she was reflecting back and trying to figure out, you know, what is those processes of becoming, uh, let's call not fluent, but just competent in uh, two different languages that are different. And what's the major obstacle to it? And she came down with the, the concept that was that, that hit us is really true and as people have picked it up in different ways, is that what the education we were sustained in was a form of cognitive imperialism. It not only took away culture, it took away knowledge, it took away heritage, but it really took our ability to relate to nature and even relate to other people except in a very superficial way. And mm -hmm. all that was of a form of imperialism and colonialism and racism that people don't talk about or weren't talking about. They would say, well, this is sort of cultural assimilation. But Marie said, no, this is really cognitive. It's really going deeper into something they should never be. 
Um, you can call it assimilation. You can call it a whole lot of words in English. But the one that captures it the best is cognitive imperialism, that this is a system that teaches you forcibly another knowledge system and says it's not only universal and says it's not only superior to all others, mm. um, but mostly it teaches us to be violent and to be competitive and to try and, if you're going to achieve knowledge, you have to do it in such a, a violent structure of education. And people who come out got lost. We were the first generation um, that became known as uh, split heads, that somehow we knew English and we also knew a, an indigenous language. And we could float back and forth somewhat, uh, not effortlessly, but as a final product uh, with some kind of smoothness between the two concepts. Um, and then we started thinking, well, how do you do that? And so all the people we knew we tried to talk to in both languages, no one knew how they could do it, but they could do it. Uh, and it wasn't a conscious thing and they couldn't do it into a mathematical formula or any way we talked about. And so we came down to the idea that, you know, this is really spirit. This is spirit talking mm -hmm. to us, which we call consciousness, but they're not new spirits, they're ancient spirits. And if they're ancient spirits talking to us and trying to communicate to us, even after we've been through this abusive Eurocentric education system, you know, maybe we should pay attention. Something really important is going on. And that started us in the process of saying, this is so important, we've got to protect it. And at first it was just, we got to protect the language, but then we realized that in the language is all the heritage and all the knowledge of a people. And once you understand the structure of the, the language and how to say it, you also have the tools to unpack all of nature and most of human contact. And we, we, we then said, well, if we don't want to just copy the white man and we don't want to just copy Eurocentric concepts in government and health, in all manifest of life, we really have to protect indigenous knowledge and heritage. Self-determination is really a great concept, but it means nothing if you don't have indigenous knowledge and heritage to guide you on how to be a self-determining person. And so that all coalesced and sprung out of the idea, first that Eurocentric education is a form of cognitive imprisonment or assimilation or imperialism that traps you into their worldview, their, their knowledge system, and you get trapped and you, you won't respect where you came from and the people in your ancestry and, and their heritage, mm. which live for a long period of time without any of that uh, English, uh, French education stuff. That uh, s sounds so familiar uh, to much of our audience today and also uh, to the things that uh, our friend Tom Clotten has talked about, uh, that it's it's not just protecting the language, but the language itself is part of a larger complex. Our friends uh, in uh, Snanemoch Nation have a longhouse and learning longhouse learning and healing framework and language is a component of that bundle on a pathway to healing and remembering who you were and who you are. Uh, so I, I like that a lot. Uh, one of the things that in our efforts within the school district to change, um, I saw you reference in your book, it's that Eurocentric illusion that this is the way it is and that this is normal and this is international. It's just the way things are. Can you talk a little bit about that Eurocentric illusion? Because it seems to me that that's a, that's a prison in itself of people who are trying to personally or professionally or organizationally embark on any kind of reconciliation journey to try to figure things out. Well, uh, it really started out, everyone just called it the white man way of thinking when I was a child and 
you just have to do this or else you're going to get in a lot of trouble uh, with everyone. Um, but then we, everyone started calling it Western when we were in university. And I said, well, we're West. But it has nothing to do with being West. What are they talking about? And then we started looking into that and you realize that what, what myths this thing is built upon, this language structure. I mean, one, there is no Europe continent. It's part of Asia that they don't want to talk about. You know, they don't want to talk about that. So they call that the Orient and they call themselves the Occidental and all these uh, crazy names uh, as Eurocentric as a knowledge system was developing. But it's all developed from a whole bunch of myths and stories that are really dubious when you start unpacking them and saying, you know, we know that th there is some violence in the world, but we would never put these stories up as our creation stories and things like that. So as we started unpacking it, we started realizing that this whole Eurocentricism is a constructed knowledge system by certain scholars and religious people over a long time. And it has a lot of voices in there, a lot of appropriated knowledge from other people like mathematics from Islamic. Uh, they appropriated it all and put it into certain languages. And then they call that superior. And the whole colonial mission was to make sure that every child believe in something that was detached from where he was connected. And so when you open a history book, you start with the Greeks, or you may start with the Romans, or you may start with just the British Empire. But none of that stuff makes any sense if you're in North America. You know, it's not the place you're connected with. It's not the ecological spirits that's talking to you. It's a, a manufactured belief system that can't really prove that it exists except that it's got this coercive force called an education system and the education mm -hmm. system has done nothing but perpetuate it under the guise that this is universal and this is absolutely the truth and all of its methods are connected but when you look at it all it is is a bunch of diversity fighting with each other inside. Like when you go to the universities, they're always fighting between English department and the audiovisual department and the sociology people don't agree with the anthropology people and the linguists don't agree with any of the above. You know, and you're going, hey, there's no unity in this Eurocentric thing. There's just force and presumption and, sent, and it creates the illusion that this is the way humans are. Mm. And that's not the way humans are. That's one version of a human that has really a, a terrible history of wars and wars and wars and has never known peace. Um, so when you reach to education, when we look back to education, we, we really say that we have to change the education system that there's nothing inherently wrong with the Eurocentric story, if you're that people. It's just one of the many languages uh, in the UN. It's just one of the many languages uh, in the world. And if you really want to know, you have to know a lot about other language systems and how they approach that. And the only place that that really functions in the world is the UN. And so, we you know, we started there because they had six languages plus a legalese language that's the seventh language that controls how they write things. But when we got there, we found out that the Eurocentric education system was so universally forced on people that they would start asking, what's indigenous knowledge? You're not supposed to have no knowledge. You're indigenous. You're savage. You know, mm. you don't have any knowledge. And that's what they had been taught through the Eurocentric education is we're just savages with no knowledge, no laws, no government, no this. 
we're, we're the exact opposite. And we, then we realized how deeply the world's education systems have bought into Eurocentricism and had bought into how they look at indigenous people as almost subhuman, as we found out in the human rights section that they said we didn't have human rights because we were the wrong kind of humans. And that created a, a big fight among us because all of our translated names terms talk to us about being this human that carries all this stuff. But the, what we were fighting is a residue of about 200 to 300 years of forced coercive education around the world under colonization. It didn't matter whether it was French or English or Spanish, it had the same result. You know, and that education system had made us believe in another knowledge system uh, that we really didn't have any connection to outside of the education system and the society that was based around that education system. And so when we come to say we're going to respect our and protect our indigenous knowledge and heritage in schools, we have to start with language and then slowly work into the, the depth of the understanding about a certain ecology. Because in the end, the, end, the indigenous languages only describe a certain ecology, place, territory, but it does comprehensively, more so than any scientist that's ever been developed in the Eurocentric system, because uh, it knows it in a uh, depth of just generation mm -hmm. after generation after generation. So we, in our uh, Micmac knowledge systems in schools, we we try and encourage everyone to go to Micmac immersion for the first four years, or they can go the normal route. Mm -hmm. um, the Micmac immersion ends about the fourth or fifth grade, and then they start moving into the school uh, with the other English speakers and things like that, because kids learn English without a school system. You know, it's on television, it's radio, it's hip hop. They learn that quicker, quick because mm -hmm. it's all voluntary. They want to know about this stuff. So we didn't mm -hmm. have to focus so much on just English. They knew they would know that. They might not know the structure of it. But what we found out in our educational system is that those people who start with the Micmac language first succeed higher than ones who started in the English section. And they are the ones who go on to university and become doctors and lawyers. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's no harm in them starting from one language group. But if you do the language right, the language gives them their identity and tells them the stages of life they're going to go through in forming that identity and never think that the identity is finished. You know, and that mm -hmm. that core teachings about how to be a how to be at peace with yourself, how to be at peace with who you are and your ancestors and the place you're living and your neighbors and all those other things and how to develop in the fourth or fifth grade this concept of friendship and what that means in um, an indi indigenous language and what it means in a European language and the difference between their concepts of kinship and relationship and the concept of, uh, of identity. But if you give them all that in an education system and you start with the indigenous language first as a cognitive tool, um, they turn out uh, somewhat better than the others. The others do just as well eventually, but that's because both of them combine and create because they're uh, relatives and kins and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. They they create a what we're calling a transsystemic or a two-eyed seeing of the world that benefits both of them. But it doesn't mm -hmm. matter uh, really how you end up. It's if you start on the right note of learning who you are and your parents and uh, getting that down fairly pat in the first three or four years of formal education. Uh, you do okay, 
You know, that's been uh, our experience here in, in the province BC too. And what you're saying, uh, Rob Matthews talked to me about Chief of Tom School and that transition into uh, the local broader school district. Uh, if they could teach their children who they are first through their language, then they tend to do okay when they transition over. Uh, it's a struggle if they don't though. Um, yes. And I see that some cotton nodding too, that uh, he's had that experience personally along the way. So um, I wanna explore a little bit more about indigenous languages because in the book, they, you and uh, Marie talk about how indigenous languages contain ways to understand people's participation in the flux of the universe. And you alluded a little bit to that uh, about teaching young ones, but as I've gone along learning uh, how to meet them here, it's opened up ways of how to be a better human in relationship to this land. Uh, and it's all contained within that language and its structure and the words that are used. And, uh, and it just talks about a different way of being. And I've described the languages and learning those languages and our responsibility to those languages as perhaps having the answer to saving humanity. Well, I, I agree with that all. Oh, you know, the, um, the Algonquin or what we call Ilnu language group is, um, it's, uh, it's such a language that doesn't uh, really have any uh, nouns, what you'd call in English nouns that are the center of it. You can make nouns, mm -hmm. But the whole center of it is being and uh, action, you know. And you put words yeah. together to make nouns. But the whole core is is action. Uh, what's the action? And you have suffixes and prefixes to tell you your relationship to the action. Like if it's a story you heard, but you you didn't think it up, you you use a different word to begin the story that tells your audience, this is what I heard. And then you move on to the action of how you heard and how you listen. All of that stuff is really more important than having a noun. Because as we know in nature, everything changes, everything's in a cycle. And the, what you have to figure out uh, through indigenous languages is the flux of that cycle to maintain your balance. That if you think you're going to be the same as you are when you're 15, uh, when you're 75, uh, you have a lot to learn in between there about why that's not true. But the whole ecology, the whole world in the indigenous world is capturing the changes that are always trans transforming. So it's really the understanding of the transformation of the transformation because that's the key to life. And that's the key to the concept of love and kindness. That's the key to uh, treating all the spiritual life forces of a, an ecology uh, with respect and understanding that they're part of you, even though you don't have the same form, they still float through you with the same sounds and the same things and you can do that. And one of the great mysteries we used to have uh, as children that our elders always said is, how come the human voice is the only voice in the entire uh, environment that echoes? That if you hear an animal echo, it's not an animal, it's a human, opposing as an animal. Because the only thing that echoes is a human voice. And you go, we spent years trying to figure out why that happened. I haven't figured it out, but it, I know it's fairly true, but it's, it says something about our voice that's connected to something else in the environment and spirit and the world that can talk back to us. And we have to know that that's always with us. And that's really a gift of the language. Once you understand the language and then the knowledge starts floating in through the the structure of the language, you don't have to make all the sounds perfect, but you, you have to understand how to put the sounds together. And by knowing how to put the sounds together, you're really talking about your being in a world 
not the world is something separate from you that you don't have any control over. And so all of that, as you learn the language, and that's why the elders were so revered in the past, because they had all that experience with learning the language and talking about the environment and watching kinships develop and how to strengthen those kinships and how to move through it with love and mm -hmm. with patience. All that stuff is in the language when it tries to tell you, this is how you're related. And that's more important than any social science book or uh, anything else that tries to capture that, like a self-help book. Mm -hmm. You know, that language is self-help. Uh, it teaches you all that things. And when you hear it and when you listen, it's just as powerful as when you speak it. Mm -hmm. But moving from listening to hearing um, to understanding to responding is a great process that's a still a mystery to most of us. And we know it goes on, but it's still one of those spiritual mysteries. And our teachings say that we could do that with animals and plants previously, but we did something wrong. So they don't talk to us as much as they used to, but they can to certain people, but not to all people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's been our experience along the way here too around learning hope to meet them is it it just causes you to walk differently in the world and to see things differently in the world and that's what makes me suspect that uh, there's something within indigenous languages that uh, could change the trajectory of the th how things are going in the world. Well, um, that's what we decided. Yeah. It was very important. We had to protect all of that, mm -hmm. but we didn't know what that meant at the time. But it took us on a wild journey through it, intellectual property and how do you maintain and control that versus everyone who's trying to appropriate it for certain means and how do you keep your own personal integrity when there's a history of Eurocentric thought just doing nothing but taking, taking, and taking, and taking and leaving you nothing in, in return except uh, the idea that somebody stole something from you or it did cognitive imperialism to you and sold your soul or your spirit uh, and your gift that the creator and life gave you to ex exercise. And if you don't exercise that gift that was given to you, many bad things happen because those spirits are not imperative. They're suggestive, but they never go away. And they're always telling you, well, you're not that smart. You're, you know, you're you make this mistake and that's terrible about the mistake in life as if it's not part of nature uh, that's all part of learning that knowing language and protecting that indigenous language and all the knowledge that's heritage that's combined in it you won't learn it all at once everyone wants to know everything so quick now like ordering a book you know i read the book and i know it you, you only know what we've been able to express, but the spirit behind it all, the, the force of you even being curious, mm -hmm. you have to pay attention to that because that awe and awe wall of the world is always there. And if you're not paying attention to it, you're not learning. You're numb no. to it. You aren't learning uh, either in any language or any heritage. And you can learn in all of them. And that would be a great blessing if we could all speak many, many, many languages and understand many languages would be much better people. Mm -hmm. Now, the title of your book says Protecting Indigenous Knowledge and Heritage, A Global Challenge. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how those agreements, those pieces of legislation uh, from the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, to even the things that are going around on in around the Mi'kmaq education. There, there's similar things going on, but there's some actions that have been taking, uh, taken that make it more likely that Indigenous knowledge and heritage is going to be protected. Can you talk a little bit about those efforts? Yeah, um, the efforts that are ongoing now are just really now creating new obligations on both the BC government and Canada, but they all trace back to the fight that we had to have in the, the UN over 
one, are, are indigenous people humans? And we were really some kind of subhumans. And then were you uh, minorities? Um, they wouldn't go so far as to say nations or states because that's who they are. You know, but the whole question about what came to us in the UN is what are we really trying to do here? You know, some said, well, we're trying to be human. And we said, okay, what's different from our humanity than their humanity? You know, what, what makes us come on these plane flights across the ocean to this once castle of some aristocracy that is now called the UN? And to say we want to be human and we want to be, uh, have all the rights as any other human. And that started not only a yearly battle uh, with the states about uh, their obligations to us as humans, but also to our knowledge and our, our heritage and our language and also our, our new rights, like the right of self-determination. Like we could never find a, a word for self-determination in all the languages. It came out as gobbledygook. You know, there, there is no self, there is no determination. These are all spiritual terms and forces. This is action. It, it's not a concept. We've always had it. Um, and we had to settle to call in it for the longest time, the fire. It's the fire within. It's the, the story of the, the fires, uh, the great fire that created humans and how the spark of the fire is within every human and uh, the three fires and the, uh, all the, the fire councils and things like that. And all the fires where you sit around and talk about things. And the key thing was with fire is that it always starts from a small spark, but it only expands outward, you know? And that's why the fire became our metaphor for self-determination because it starts with what inherent rights you have that you're born with, not only in indigenous knowledge systems, but in every major religious spiritual system, they say the same thing, that you have this spirit, this thing within you. And that's what's really important is finding out that spirit within you and understanding that every person you may has that same fire in different connotations. And it's a blessing of that fire that he's carrying or she's carrying that makes the whole world work. And you have to understand that. And then we, of course, extend it to non-humans, which is what they called it in the UN. We said, what do you, you called us non-human 10 years ago, but now we were human. So let's, let's talk about all those plants and animals are also spiritual parts of the thing that we call earth or the biosphere and all that. Mm -hmm. We're all together. There's not any difference except in form, but beyond the form, spiritually, they're all connected. So that led us to the journey to get the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which only gives us, we could only negotiate the most, uh, minority but most important parts of inherent rights and the important word is inherent rights these rights aren't given by any government they're not given by any uh, organization that's artificial these come from nature these come from ancestors uh, these come to us with birth and no one should change these inherent rights and part of those inherent rights are protecting indigenous knowledge and heritage. And, you know, it took us on the UN system 10 years to prove we were a form of humanity. And then we had to explain how we were humans and how we had to protect that from appropriation by others um, because that's what they had been doing for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And now, um, Took us 24, 25 years to get that through, another 10 years to get BC and um, Canada to agree that 
we have these inherent rights and that they have to adjust all their laws to conform to these inherent rights as well as treaty rights when those are considered supreme and over some of the inherent rights because that comes from our ancestors agreements which are considered sacred uh, and inviolable in the UN system. So these inherent rights belong to us and governments have to respect it. And the inherent rights are related, but a little bit different, a little bit broader than Aboriginal rights, but they're the same source. But indigenous rights are bigger and broader than what people think of as Aboriginal rights in the constitution. But the UN declaration clarifies what those Aboriginal rights are in a minimum scope, but in a global scope. And the governments are now trying to put together plans. And of course, they always focus on the wrong things. I think in the BC plan, there's about six or seven categories for culture, mm. you know, and language, you know, and we're saying, you're going to do the land, you're going to do government, you're going to, you're going to do all these abstract things, but you're not going to protect our indigenous knowledge except in four or five ways, which are, you know, renaming parks and things mm -hmm. like that, reclaiming mm -hmm. names, which are important, but that's not nearly enough their obligation in the UN declaration. And so we've been very critical about, you know, they're really not focused on what's protecting our humanity, what's protecting our self-determination, what's protecting our identity is all these indigenous knowledges and heritage, and they're not focusing on that in the way they should. Mm. We've got a, qu a question that relates to that too in our Q&A. Uh, the question from Linda says, language shapes the world and we shape the world through language. How do you keep indigenous languages, even if they're preserved, from being corrupted by the predominant settlement point of view. And you talk a little bit about that in your book around the challenges around translatability or, or inability to, to translate from indigenous worldviews into that, uh, to a, a settler mindset. And well, just the challenges, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, for a long time, uh, we thought, I remember when we were learning, uh, what they called uh, English in grammar school. And all of us kids were, we, we were just learning English that way. Our, our parents talked it, but they didn't know anything about its structure. And for the longest time, uh, because the people who had gone to school before us, we didn't know it was called English because they had always said, we got to go to the anguish class. The class that's filled with so much anguish of trying to say what's this noun and who's the actor and all, all this thing English wants you to learn. Um, that, that concept is the same thing that the old anthropologists and Eurocentric people who tried to translate uh, an indigenous language to English would say it's non-translatable. That's most of the problems of the residential school system of people not being able to translate it at that time and place for whatever reason, um, mostly because they're taken away from their parents and were raised in an artificial environment. Mm -hmm. But they, at that point, um, didn't have the ability to translate between the two languages. So they just lost the indigenous part of the language. And but they never lost the spirit and they never lost the, the voices that carried with them that told them that, you know, there's something else to you that you need to know about, mm -hmm. whether it's in a dream or a vision or, or anything. And many people tried to escape that dilemma, that cognitive dilemma and didn't make it. But for some reason, our generation after World War II um, was able to make that shift we used to say it must have been Elvis, you know, that helped us learn English because it wasn't the English teacher. Um, 
because he had a little bit of an indigenous mm -hmm. background. But, you know, it, something happened. Then all of a sudden, we it took us a long time in our English class. We never really quite got there through the formal English class. But somewhere along the line, it sort of clicked in that we could negotiate between these two knowledge systems. But the problem with the English interpretation that they won't give up their English structure of their language and they keep forcing um, a verb-based action-centered in world language into noun, verb, object. Mm. And it doesn't work. Yeah, we've had those conversations here around uh, Hulkamitnam and having English phrases be sent to our Hulkamitnam teachers to say, uh, can you translate this into Hulkamitnam, please? And we've reached a stage where we say, no. <laughs> but if you tell me more about what it is you are doing, we could probably find a Hulkamitnam phrase that speaks to that, but yeah. we're not going to translate you know that they just they just assume so much that we're there for their purposes, and the language is for their purposes, not for our purposes. And that no longer will we be forced to choose to to learn only English or French. Um, we're going to learn our own language, and as we learn the language, we'll be able to translate a better and better with more acuity. But it's got to be something that's natural. If it's an artificial concept, we're wasting our time. Mm -hmm. We've gone You're through right. a little bit uh, in constitutional talks trying to translate. We get, went through that in the UN in trying to translate these English terms into the five other languages. No problem with French, uh, no problems really with Spanish. But when we hit Chinese and Islamic, holy, these words didn't even turn out. Mm -hmm. Any close, and I had the benefit of sitting at the UN table that had to translate all these things because no documents official mm -hmm. until it's translatable into all languages, and the arguments they had about what these concepts meant was just just mind blowing because they they knew each other's language enough they could switch back and forth and back and mm -hmm. forth, but moving between the English. Roman kind of language and the the acrylics language and the uh, the the Mandarin uh, symbols ideograph language was just mm -hmm. incredible watching them do that but they had all captured another world and had worked on it a long time so they mm -hmm. had uh, deep traditions because we were an oral nation and we just named places um, for what they meant and for what happened there. Um, it, we don't have the same kind of noun structure that they need in the English language and French languages. Mm -hmm. We had that earlier experience too with a previous guest. They had uh, traveled the world and we're talking about the concept of wild and wilderness and yeah. where they were quite, uh, it was quite striking, right, when you met somebody who lived in another language and another way of seeing the world, that there was nothing in their languages that talked about wild and wilderness. This was just where we live. This is us, right? And these are our relatives. So it was, uh, no it was quite striking. No, no words. So, yeah, it did, I, I like the part around the, the language and the struggles around translatability. What, what makes me think about the work that we're doing in the Nanaimo Ladies Smith Public Schools is through the policy framework of CIA us, it says that we're, we understand that the way that we've been structured and the way that we work and the policies and the legislation that guides who and how we operate as a public school system has not been successful uh, for too many people for too long. And we, we seek to find a different way of going about it that's more reflective of the teachings and the land that we're on. And so when I come across non-translatability uh, of so many of those concepts, it worries me that we'll, we'll never get there. But one of the things that you and I talked about was, we'll just do something. Yeah. We'll just, we'll just do something. 
it's so. humans. We're not godlike. Mm -hmm. No one will ever know everything about nature or everything about humankind or anything about themselves. You know, we have to accept that humble position that this is where our consciousness is. You know, but our consciousness is dynamic and it's never going to be stale and it's never going to stop creating new concepts uh, to explain things in the natural world. And it's going to develop, like I had mentioned earlier, um, in Micmac, we have the concept of Miklish. For those who don't speak uh, Micmac, they can speak English, and all they have to do is add suffix and prefixes that are in Micmac to make it understandable to others. Mm -hmm. So we can include them in, even though they don't speak the language as fluently as some. But they can move toward that using Miklish uh, with no um, shame that they're they're learning and this is how they learn, and they have to learn from their being outward, not the world inward. You know, mm -hmm. and so however they use the language is acceptable. There are some residential school graduates who think, well, there's only one way to do it. We keep saying, yeah, we we've been through that cognitive imperialism process that's violent that wants to judge everyone and say you're not coming up to certain standards or things like that but none of that helps when you're doing a policy that your your policy has to say this is the kind of human this school has to produce hmm. nothing big this is the kind of life people have to learn to create sustain and flourish. Nothing about I'm the principal, you're the, all these European roles get in the way that everyone has to have. What is the purpose of all this? What are we trying to put out? What is the action? What is the self-determining child we want? Is it an obedient child that never questions you? Is it one that interacts with everyone and tries to find a way? Or is it someone who has arrogance and thinks they know it all. You know, you have to decide what is it the human output that your educational system is going to do. Mm -hmm. And we have all the constitutional tools. We have all the uh, UN tools. We have all the uh, UN Declaration Act in BC, and we now have the uh, Act in Canada that they have to change their laws to affect to be consistent with, and we keep saying, that's what educational system should be doing. Mm -hmm. They should be evaluating all their policies to see if they're consistent with protecting indigenous languages, knowledges, and heritage, and putting out a person that we want to be. Mm -hmm. No, that's uh, that's reassuring too. That we can just take a step. I like how you phrase it. Well, let's move toward that. Uh, wherever you're at, wherever you're from, whatever the skills you have, let's move toward that. And you can take how whatever steps you like to keep us moving toward that. Some of us uh, end up having more influence within the system, so we can move it a lot further down the line. But everybody can take a piece of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. One of our uh, a guests from earlier, and a friend of ours, she said, uh, Anishinaabe just it means to be a good person. Yeah. So, so that that's how that translates. And I, I love that idea because just buried solidly with it can't be separated from an indigenous language is an is an accountability structure and an obligation to be a good person. That's who you are. So I like that idea as well. Uh, Sakesh, it's a, a wonderful read. It's a challenging read. It's not uh, it's not a simple read, but uh, I've loved reading it. I, I like some of the non controversial or uh, contro might be controversial, but there's no um, 
there's no black and white, or there's no gray area between how you think about the things and the and the way that you and uh, Marie both spoke about them. So I appreciated that about the book. Uh, there's a path forward in there as well. It's not all uh, doom and gloom, but there's some obligations that uh, all of us can take a piece of and move forward. So as we come to a close, I'm going to turn it back over to our friend Tom Quatton to uh, bring our house to a close. All right, let's see him. CM Shayas Sakaj. I got an Hail CM Squalo and Hatana Quail. See it, Amatan. I got Sasaket at an Squiam Tito Namet at an Aquail. I got a quam quam stuck to Squalo and Allop. I hua kwam kwam ta eli nishwala kwa tsetha mathama atana kwail, aitka si em. Really raising our hands to you for laying down your story. It's really helping us bring great strength in our thoughts and our minds and our, our spirit and our feelings as we hear. hear your story. It's very powerful and very deep and has my mind spinning around. Oh, so beautiful. We are, we, it is a great honor for us to spend some time with you. And I'm probably gonna have to watch this recording a couple more times start unpacking it and helping understand who I am, who we are as a school district and the direction that we want, would like to go for our children. So nestlikwiris kwitstuch tanatzultz eilish at nawa siem shayel haitka at anhayel siem shkwalman. Raising our hands to you and thanking you for bringing forward your most respected and honorable feelings and sharing it with us in a very meaningful way. Aitka, CM, Aitka. Thank you for joining us, everybody out there. And uh, again, Sakesh, uh, with all uh, respect, uh, and send our regards to Murray as well. We've really enjoyed the book. She's my Valentine. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much. Hey, it was. Thank you, Sakesh.